The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan, by Samuel Tomsic. This is part one of chapter two. Chapter two is called The Capitalist Unconscious, A, Retor a Return to Freud. Um, part one is called Welton Shang. When it comes to Freud's relation to politics, notably to Marxism, we cannot ignore his self-proclaimed indifference in political matters. However, as soon as we go through his writings on culture and religion, we notice that this indifference is expressed in a rather unusual way. Freud never simply avoids political issues. Instead, he proposes a new form of addressing them through distortions and displacements, a form that corresponds to the psychoanalytic method and to the nature of its object. It would therefore be wrong to see in the unconscious a retreat from the social into into a sphere of strictly private life that has absolutely no connection to social reality. Yet it would be equally false to presuppose the existence of a collective unconscious, a container of universal cultural artifacts and archetypes. The Freudian unconscious is clearly more sophisticated. It abolishes the division of the subjective and the social, the private and the public, albeit not in the sense of the slogan, the personal is the political, but in the sense that the existence and the formal mechanisms of the unconscious depend on the same structures which determine the functioning of social links. Both Lacan's axiom, the unconscious is structured like a language, and his later claims that the unconscious exists only in discourse, address the singular status of the unconscious within social structures. This implies that the subject of the unconscious, the subject in its dependency on the signifier and not the subject of cognition, is the subject of politics. Psychoanalysis isolates the political subject from its ideological fictions, be it homo legalis, the abstract subject of right, homo economicus, the no less abstract subject of political economy, citoyen, etc. With this distinction, the flip side to the constitution of the social is brought to light. The discursive existence of the unconscious, its insistence as an extimate discursive consequence, uncovers the point in which the given social order determines the production of subjectivity and names the instability of the given order, the point from which emancipatory or revolutionary politics inevitably needs to depart in order to produce social change. This is, as we shall see in the following section, the main point of Marx's determination of the proletariat as a social symptom. This concrete social embodiment of the universal subjective position in capitalism, and the only possible point from which the abolition of the capitalist mode of production can be brought about. The motto shared between Marx and Freud would therefore be the impersonal is the political, namely the impersonal core of the personal. The difference between Freud and Lacan in these matters is nevertheless striking. While Lacan never avoids polemical confrontation with the logic of capital, Freud barely addresses capitalism under its proper name. Instead, he prefers to speak about culture, thereby giving the discussion an apparently neutral scientific and sociological tone. Another example is ideology. In his works, Freud undoubtedly develops a critique of ideology but under the screen notion of Weltanschauung, worldview, an expression that covers everything from philosophy and politics to art and religion, designating a specific tendency in the constitution of reality, its totalization and meaningful framing. Freud's discussion of Marxism will take place within this perspective and within the broader epistemological framework of the distinction between the worldview knowledge and the scientific knowledge. Freud's entire published work contains one single reflection on Marxism, and even this returns out rather disappointing, as he approaches it with the highest possible reserve. Freud expresses his lack of competence in discussing the variety of Marxist orientations, and focuses merely on the so-called worldview Marxism, which enables him to envisage a logical similarity between Marxism and religion. Of course, most Marxists will be horrified by this idea, but before passing any judgment, it is worth looking at the broader context of Freud's take 
on the general worldview mechanisms. We find these developments in the closing chapter of Freud's new introductory lectures, lectures on psycho psychoanalysis. The collection was published at a dramatic historical moment, 1933, four years after the economic crash and the same year in which Hitler was elected German Chancellor. It was also a time when no one could ignore the dramatic failure of the Soviet Revolution with the dominance of Stalinism. The lectures address a fictional audience and revise Freud's metapsychological theories. The chapter on Welton Shang forms an exception, both epistemologically and critically, since behind the discussion of the antagonisms between science and religion, Freud simultaneously delivers his critical responses to the already widespread Freudo Marxism whose enfant terrible at the time was none other than Wilhelm Reich. When Freud insists that all efforts should be made to inscribe psychoanalysis in the modern scientific paradigm, he implicitly condemns the efforts in his broader circle to shape psychoanalysis in accordance with an actually existing political worldview. Certainly one could argue that the political readings of psychoanalysis are not unrelated to Freud's discussions of social mechanisms, which already produced some sort of spontaneous political philosophy. In the face of works such as Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, on which the Frankfurt School leader grounded its critique of totalitarian personality, or civilization and its discontents, which guided Marcuse's critique of social repression, it is all the more surprising that Freud concludes not only that there is no such thing as a psychoanalytic worldview, but even that every immediate application of psychoanalysis to politics should be avoided. Where does this reserve come from? The answer lies in the logic of worldviews, as the lecture in question outlines it. Freud begins his critique by enumerating and discussing the general features of every worldview. His definition sounds classical from the outset. In my opinion, when a Weltanschauung is an intellectual construction, which solves all the problems of our existence uniformly on the basis of one overriding hypothesis, which accordingly leaves no question unanswered, and in which everything that interests us finds its fixed place, it will easily be understood that the possession of a Weltanschauung of this kind is among the ideal wishes of human beings. The main achievement of worldview thus consists in totalizing reality and thereby providing its meaningful interpretation. It does not leave any questions open and situates the variety of human interests under one general hypothesis. Anim anime? Presupposition. At first glance, the definition does not seem to bring any novelties to the understanding of worldview mechanisms. Yet such novelty lies in the conclusion a unifying worldview stands in a specific relation to unconscious desire, whose reality manifests itself through the construction of a given worldview. A worldview then appears as a neutral interpretation of the world, a construction of reality. But behind this interpretation, Freud reveals a mechanism that establishes the conditions for the satisfaction of desire, a dispositive that supports its undisturbed fulfillment. In this respect, the critique of worldview mechanisms reaches back to the earliest psychoanalytic discoveries regarding the mechanisms that satisfy an unconscious tendency through the production of symbolic formations. Freud aims here notably at, at dreams, which are nothing less than intellectual formations that codify a demand for satisfaction, so that he extends his early wish fulfillment theory to the way discursive mechanisms construct intersubjective reality. More precisely, through his worldview critique, Freud points out the place where the unconscious should be situated. Desire is not simply a psychological formation, but the name of a specific structural dynamic that needs to be placed on the very line that joins subjective and social reality. Desire is the border beyond which there is, strictly speaking, no other reality. The same structure and the same formal mechanisms work in the unconscious and in the social link. Freud's worldview critique is therefore not to be rejected as yet another psychologism. Worldviews thus raise a logical problem that Freud approaches through the work of interpretation, which amounts to the totalization of reality. He thereby evokes the famous lines from Heine, 
in which the poet mocks philosophy. Life in the world's too fragmented for me. A German professor can give me the key. He puts life in order with skill magisterial, builds a rational system for better or worse. With nightcap and dressing gown scraps for material, he chinks up the holes in the universe. Freud already used the very same reference in the interpretation of dreams to illustrate one of the main achievements of the dream work, secondary elaboration, through which unconscious labor combines the loosely linked dream material in a whole and narrated structure. The philosopher is thus comparable to the unconscious laborer, whose main task is to create the conditions for the fulfillment of unconscious desire, to interpret reality so that it will support satisfaction. Clearly, this is not a very flattering vision of philosophy. The more an interpretation is totalizing and the more meaning it produces, the more the constituted reality successfully makes unconscious demand. The connection of desire with worldview means that unconscious fantasy is implemented in reality, that it supports the constitution of reality as a consistent and framed totality. What Freud criticizes in philosophical ontologies and theories of cognition is that they remain blind to the structuring function of fantasy. There is no reality without a phantasmatic support, and consequently there is no discourse without the unconscious. With the same move, Freud dismisses the Freudo-Marxist hypothesis of the exclusively oppressive character of social mechanisms. Social reality does not simply repress or suppress the creative potentials of desire, drive, and sexuality. On the contrary, it serves as its privileged art articulation and consistency. Desire is not the producer. It is itself produced, while the producer is situated elsewhere. How exactly Freud approaches the relation between desire and productive unconscious labor will be examined further below. What matters for now is that for Freud, no reality is consistently objective. And every worldview, every ideological construction contains a wish fulfillment. This logical connection between desire and interpretation that Freud encounters in worldviews explains why he categorically rejects every attempt to construct a psychoanalytic worldview. Psychoanalysis intervenes on a different level. Its function is not to provide the conditions for satisfaction, but to uncover the mechanisms that articulate unconscious desire in a specific dispositive of satisfaction, thereby revealing that behind the apparent conflict between this desire and social reality, there is a certain complicity between desire and interpretation. For this reason, psychoanalysis does not liberate desires, it rather transforms through interpretation, the formal mechanism of satisfaction directing the subject towards the problematic kernel of the unconscious mode of production. This is the main point of the famous Freudian wo es war sol ich worden, where there seems to have been an automatic regime of production, the unconscious mode of jouissance. There the place that the subject should be revealed, a place where subjectivation can take place. And this subjectivation entails a transformation of the overall mechanism. The task of psychoanalysis is thus in clear opposition to worldviews. It does not interpret reality by feeding it with more meaning. It creates the conditions under which the subject will be able to produce a transformative act. This change appears to be impossible due to repression, which is actually the case. Although the Freudian notion of repression differs significantly from suppression or oppression. For Freud, the mechanisms of repression are constitutive of the unconscious tendency, and if we want to, do, want to attribute to the unconscious productive potential, then it does not pertain to the repressed desire, but to repression itself, in which Freud recognizes productive unconscious labor. Freud's response to the attempts to construct a psychoanalytic worldview is highly enigmatic. As a specialist science, a branch of psychology, a depth psychology or psychology of the unconscious. Psychoanalysis is entirely unsuitable to construct a Welton Shang of its own. It must assume the scientific one. Psychoanalysts should refrain from inventing a worldview because there is an underlying incompatibility between psychoanalysis and worldview tendencies, which makes, which makes psychoanalysis appear as a saboteur.
Consequently, an analyst cannot unveil the underlying mechanisms that support the satisfaction of unconscious tendencies and provide conditions for their perpetuated satisfaction. The contradiction between psychoanalysis and ideological tendencies could not be sharper, but the conclusion Freud draws from this contrast is that, is that not even the analysts can do entirely without a worldview, so they should simply follow the example of the father of psychoanalysis who adopted the scientific one. Freud's persistent claim to a scientific status of psychoanalysis is only seemingly neutral. It actually contains a scientific or a scientistic worldview, a fulfillment of Freud's epistemological desire. Behind the apparent unsuitability of forming a consistent worldview, there is a more fundamental impossibility. Psychoanalysis cannot totalize reality, nor can it predict future events in mental life. And finally, it reveals that even the past is subjected to retroactive modifications. The past is not a state, but a movement. These restrictions differentiate psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis from other positive sciences, notably from physics, medicine, and biology, on which Freud wanted to construct, a, construct the scientificity of his invention, and which are all oriented, oriented toward the future, and can presumably predict events based on the already acquired knowledge. The limits of psychoanalysis logically follow from the status of the unconscious, which is by far neither an ontological substance nor a positive entity. It entirely depends on contingent and unpredictable traumatic events and on the dynamic of linguistic structures so that no particular case is universal enough to support the prediction of future developments, which is, in the end, an important part of the achievement of worldviews, the exclusion of contingency from reality life and thinking. The unconscious may be marked by the absence of time and even by the absence of con contradiction, as Freud occasionally claimed, but this absence is misleading. It does not automatically imply that the unconscious is unchangeable. It rather demonstrates its dependency on the actually existing social condition and hence on the eternity of ruling judges or ruling ideologies. As Althusser argued, the absence of time and the deformation of social antagonisms represent two central features of ideology, which consequently appears as neutral and coextensive with reality. But while Althusser declared every subject to be an imaginary effect of ideology, Lacan recognized in the subject of the signifier the central discursive consequence on which the difference of psychoanalysis from sciences and worldviews rested. If psychoanalysis wants to join positive sciences, it must abandon the hypothesis of the subject of the unconscious. Herein lies the risk of Freud's attempts to ground psychoanalysis on energetics, neurology, and biology. If, however, it wishes to produce a consistent worldview, it has to re-centralize the subject. The ego should dominate the id, as many of Freud's successors interpreted wo es war sol ich worden. Ego psychology and various forms of psychotherapy remain within the capitalist ideological framework and even openly adopt the centralized subjectivity of economic liberalism, namely a subjectivity which is consolidated around the egoistic pursuit of private interest. Just as in the context of cognition, the subject is consolidated around the self-transparent consciousness or intentionality. A more general problem concerns the idea of a scientific worldview. Does it make sense to speak of such a worldview at all? What does it designate? The personal convictions of scientists, their spontaneous philosophies? To stick to Freud's definition, a scientific worldview should not be an exception. In order to seriously compete with philosophy or religion, it would have to solve all problems of human existence, provide a meaningful interpretation of reality, and finally articulate guiding principles for social life. In short, it would have to produce knowledge, belief, and ethics. Modern science fulfills merely the first condition. What might come close to a scientific worldview are the ideals of enlightenment. Let us recall their Kantian summary. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another.
This immaturity is self-incurred if its cause is not lack of understanding, but lack of resolution and courage to use it without the guidance of another. The motto of enlightenment is therefore, Sapir Ode, have courage to use your own understanding. Would a scientific worldview entail universalization of the courage to know, the social implementation of a presumably epistemological desire that would awaken the subject from its ignorance? Akronta Muvabo, the Virgil quote that Freud placed to the head of interpretation of dreams, announcing that his publication shall shift the underground regions, repeating the Copernican revolution in psychic life, can be read together with the Kantian Sapir Ode. Freud had his most evident moment of enthusiasm for the enlightenment in the future of an illusion, his most explicit confrontation with religion, predicting the triumph of scientific knowledge over religious illusions. Along the same lines, the new introductory lectures express a hope that the intellect, the scientific spirit, reason, may in process of time establish a dictatorship in the mental life of man. Thus, for Freud, a scientifically supported dictatorship of reason and mental life is the political ideal of psychoanalysis, except that this reason, this psychoanalytic cogito, is unconscious, so that the, the dictatorship of reason would be an impossible dictatorship of the decentralized subject of the signifier that would replace the current capitalist dictatorship of the strong ego. What Lacan called jeucrasi, icracy, is the dictatorship of, of reason a psychoanalytic response to the, the dictatorship of the proletariat, maybe even just an extra, extravagant name for it? Freud would then be only one step away from Lacan's identification of the proletarian with the subject of the unconscious. On other occasions, Freud claims that modern science harms human narcissism thereby leaving no doubt that scientific knowledge satisfies no desire whatsoever. The main condition for the formation of a scientific worldview falls away. To recall again, Freud mentions three scientific insults. The decentralization of the universe in physics, which abolished the ancient idea of the finite, centralized, and harmonious cosmic order with the infinite and contingent universe. Then the decentralization of life in biology, which abolished the hierarchy of beings with man as its privileged metaphysical crown. And finally, the decentralization of thinking and psychoanalysis, which questioned the primacy of consciousness and most definitely rejected the hypothesis of a metaphysical soul. The modern scientific paradigm has exactly the opposite effect of worldview mechanisms. Instead of totalizing the stabilizing, or instead of totalizing and stabilizing both the, both the external and the internal reality, it deprives them of their center. Instead of grounding them on necessity and order, it exposes their contingency and instability. And finally, instead of producing their meaningful interpretation, it reduces them to nonsensical formal mechanisms. A scientific worldview consequently follows an entirely different logic. Production of falsifiable, uncertain, provisory knowledge detotalization and foreclosure of meaning. Freud determines the psychoanalytic relation to the scientific worldview by using the ambiguous expression ana animin. This can either mean that the scientific worldview already exists and psychoanalysis merely has to reach out and adopt it, or it can also suggest that such a worldview is simply presupposed, which would imply that positive sciences as such assume the position of a subject supposed to know. And indeed, Freud often treats positive sciences in such a way. Finally, the anime, the assumption Freud talks about in relation to the scientific worldview, can also be understood in a formal sense, as the announcement of a concurrent regime of interpretation that will undermine the established worldview form. This is what the Freudian idea of revolutionary sciences seems to address. While the existing worldviews satisfy human narcissism, Scientific decentralizations inflict wounds because a concurrent, essentially materialist worldview announces itself at least on the logical level. The struggle between science and religion is first and foremost a conflict between, between two concurrent forms of thinking.
the scientific worldview does not depart from the tendency of providing definite answers to human questions, but reformulates the questions themselves. It also does not satisfy desire, but alters the subject's relation to it. The break with the worldview interpretation is a matter of formalization, because it is only here that a concurrent regime of interpretation can be approached. This Freudian epistemological optimism is nevertheless marked by a significant shift. The pessimistic turn that accompanies writings such as Beyond the Pleasure Principle and Civilization and its discontents encounters a new problem. Instead of discussing the historic conflict between science and religion, it turns to modern culture, precisely to capitalism, where the political potential of modern scientific revolution met a more challenging limit that again concerns a specific form of thinking. The commodity form. The modern worldview operates within these formal constrictions, and in this respect the main failure of the scientific revolution consists in the incapacity to detach thinking from universal commodification and even more so in its complicity with capitalism, the embedding of scientific knowledge in the permanent capitalist revolution. Freud's pessimist turn is closely related to the fact that the universality of commodity form successfully integrated scientific knowledge into the capitalist mode of production and into its articulation of desire. What Marx described as commodity fetishism stands above all for a specific transformation of desire within and through the implementation of the capitalist worldview in social and subjective reality. The four cornerstones of this worldview, freedom, equality, property, and private interest, form an abstract coordinate system in which the sharpness of revolutionary sciences is neutralized in advance. At this point, we can move to Freud's engagement with the Marxist worldview in his lecture on Weltanschauung. After expressing his lack of competence in discussing Marxism, he sums up his reservations in the following passage. Theoretical Marxism, as realized in Russian Bolshevism, has acquired the energy and the self-contained and exclusive character of a Weltanschauung, but at the same time an uncanny likeness to what it is fighting against. Though originally a portion of science and built up in its implementation upon science and technology, it has created prohibition of thought which is just as ruthless as what as that of religion in the past. Freud then continues with how the critical conf confrontation with Marxism is forbidden and how the Soviet regime produced a fetishization of Marx's works that is comparable to that of religious texts and so on. Freud's critique of the worldview of Marxism resembles a typical right-wing moralization, yet there is something symptomatic in his discontent, something that goes beyond the moralistic tone of his remarks it concerns the very outcome of the Soviet revolution, the epistemic transformation of Marx's critique into dogmatism and the re-centralization of his theory of the subject. Freud does not talk about Marx, but about scientific socialism and the outcome of the revolution is not so much Lenin, but Stalin, the bureaucratic and not the revolutionary or the bureaucrat and not the revolutionary. Lenin nevertheless announced the worldview tendency of Marxism when he wrote, Marx's theory is omnipotent because it is true. It is comprehensive and, and harmonious. It gives men a unified worldview. Lacan returned to this passage on several occasions in order to claim the same link between omnipotence and truth for Freud's invention of psychoanalysis. And it is rather symptomatic that the citations of this pas passage often omit Lenin's specification of this omnipotence and truth. Worldview Marxism is the necessary step to dogmatism, where the dialectical materialist method that oriented the critique of political economy is replaced by the three non-dialectical worldview achievements. Lacan, too, envisaged this inversion when he expressed his astonishment that the majority of Marxists depart from the primacy of a specific figure of subjectivity, which is only subsequently alienated in the commodity form, in the process of production, and in the movement of history, while Marx's critical project openly departs from the autonomy of value, which consequently helps him discover the decentralized subject of politics, labor power and its privileged social embodiment, the proletariat,
The foundation of Marxism as a worldview demanded the abolition of this critical ground of Marxist theory. The proletariat means what? It means that labor is radicalized on the level of pure and simple commodity, which also reduces the labor, the laborer to the same price. As soon as the laborer learns to know himself as such through theory, we can say that this step shows him the way to the status of, call it what you want, a scientist. He is no longer a proletarian and sick, if I may say so. He is no longer pure in simple truth, but he is a fur sick, what we call class consciousness. He can even become the party's class consciousness where one no longer speaks the truth. The failure of the Communist Party would then consist in the fact that, in the end, it was the worldview form which determined the political organization and sabotaged the invention of a new party form, and not the other way around. This political failure is accompanied by an entire set of epistemological regressions which have already been mentioned. The difference between Marx's interpretation of the proletariat as the social embodiment personification of the truth of labor and worldview Marxism which promises to abolish alienation and to constitute a revolutionary subject of cognition overlaps with the difference between truth and knowledge. The Soviet regime replaced the social embodiment of truth, the proletarian as the true subject of revolutionary politics with a particular social embodiment of knowledge. The party is the placeholder of the collective subject of knowledge and the subject of history. Again, the movement of the critique of political economy proceeds exactly in the opposite direction, from the economic forms of knowledge to the progressive deduction of the subject of value, where also the horizon of a possible transformation is outlined, albeit without a prospective insight into the future social order. This is where Marx too adopted what Freud called the scientific worldview. Worldview Marxism reverts from this critical perspective by reducing the subject of capitalism back to knowledge, making of, making of the proletarian a savant, a scientist, subject of cognition in which the proletarian knows itself as knowledge. The point of departure is no longer the identity of alienation and structure, which in the end determines the gap between the subject of cognition and the subject of politics. This critical point of departure is now replaced by the hypothesis of a centralized and unalienate, unalienated subject of history which supposedly reaches the highest form of self-consciousness through the party, another subject supposed to know. The problem is not so much in the introduction of the party, but in the fact that the party becomes the privileged embodiment of a presupposed historical knowledge, and not an organization that opens up the space in which the historical and political truth embodied in the working class and in the surplus population can be transmitted. The party appears as the perfect opposition of what, for instance, Lacan strived to establish through the idea of the school, founded on the imperative of renewing the sharp razor of Freudian truth, the gap between knowledge and truth, and to insist on the inexistence of the other, which stands for the impossibility of the ultimate abolition of alienation. By reintroducing the subject of cognition into the critique of political economy through the hypothesis of class consciousness, Worldview Marxism futilely seeks to abolish all forms of alienation and establish authentic intersubjective relations. It thereby regresses into a pre-critical framework. The party's class consciousness is the end result of this movement. One no longer speaks of the truth, only of knowledge, which is most faithfully embodied in the party's bureaucratic apparatus. Positive scientific knowledge, and this explains Stalin's tendency to provide an essentially positivistic foundation for dialectical materialism, serves as the point where the, the subject of capitalism can presumably reach a promised self-realization beyond alienation. Freud's theory of the subject saw a similar fate when the post-Freudians decentralized the subject on the ego and deduced from Freud's woe es war soul ich worden an imperative of normalization and reintegration. Lacan's political struggle against the International Psychoanalytic Association, the psychoanalytic analog of the Stalinist party, for which the strong ego is the central instance in mental life, repeatedly turned around the translation of this ambig ambiguous Freudian axiom.
Post-Freudians have read it through the lenses of the theory of cognition and in closest compatibility with economic liberalism, while Lacan, in contrast, made it his privileged formula for alienation that constitutes the subject of the unconscious and points towards the real subject of politics. Aside from all the humanistic and moralistic appearances, Freud's critique of worldview of worldviews brings him suspiciously close to the break that inaugurated Marx's critique of political economy. The lecture on Welton Shang contains a certain repetition of the critical program from Marx's theses on Feuerbach, which leaves no doubt that for Marx, political struggles necessarily address the form of the interpretation of the world, not so much through the all too simple opposition of theory, worldview interpretation and praxis, political action, but through the actual subversion of the very praxis of interpretation. Among the many targets of Marx and Freud's critique is philosophy, of which they promote a highly problematic and outdated image. But this detail should not distract us from the fact that the true object of their critique is religion and political economy. The competition with philosophical interpretations, which in the capitalist universe clearly are found in a worse position, discredited in advance as self-centered and unprofitable. Philosophy and science are simply not as successful when it comes to satisfying desire. For the critique of political economy, the form of interpretation will, no less, will be no less important as the organization of the proletariat. And indeed, the transformation of the form of interpretation necessitates the form of organization. When Marx examines the intertwining of the social form and the commodity form, or Freud, the intertwining of the worldview mechanisms and the unconscious mechanisms of satisfaction, this already presupposes an inversion in the form of interpretation, which in psychoanalysis and in the critique of political economy supports their critique of appearances and recognizes in the commodity form the general envelope of social links and unconscious production. Another crucial aspect of Marx's critique of appearance, to repeat, concerns the breaks with the humanism and the essentialism of Feuerbach's conception of alienation. Marx's mature, Marx's mature discussion of fetishism no longer departs from the illusion that the commodity form distorts more immediate and authentic social relations. Here it makes sense to repeat the distinction between constitutive alienation, alienation that is equivalent to structure, and constituted alienation, for instance, commodity fetishism, which follows from the misperception of the relation between the appearance of value and the structure that causes this appearance. The doubling of alienation does not prevent their confusion. This is what Marx criticized in Feuerbach. Simultaneously, the twofold character of alienation reveals that constituted alienation functions as a mask or a mystification of the constitutive alienation. The flip side of commodity fetishism is the appearance that there is a more fundamental and unalienated position in the background, a position from which it would be possible to cognize the mistake that determines commodity fetishism. Commodity fetishism precisely the position of an unsplit and conflict-free ego or consciousness. This common presupposition of political economy, post-Freudian psychoanalysis and scientific Marxism. Homo econom economicus, strong ego and class consciousness are conceptual and ideological variations of the same attempt to mystify the subjective split produced by the autonomy of discourse. In distinction to these attempts to abolish alienation, which really do deserve to be called utopian, Marx's critique of political economy contains an effort to think alienation not only as reproduction of the relations of production, but also as a structural transformation of the existing mode of production. We cannot overlook that the double meaning of the term revolution is at stake here. The scientific circular movement of astronomy, astronomic bodies and the political subversion of the given social order. There is also no doubt that constitutive alienation does not address solely the alienation of the subject, but, abo but above all the alienation of the other. It makes the other appear in its split, incompleteness, contradiction, and therefore in existence. The correlate of this inexistence is the existence of the subject, the actual agency of the revolutionary process, which, 
however, does not assume the position of knowledge, but the place of truth, as Lacan persistently repeated, because the subject is produced, brought into existence in and through the gap in the other. In other words, because there is a social entity, the proletariat, which articulates a universal demand for change in the name of all, being the social embodiment of a universal subjective position. This very enunciation grounds politi politics on the link between inexistence, alienation, and universality. Capitalism, by contrast, rooted its politics on the hypothetical existence of the other, the market and other economic abstractions, the strong ego of a, of a fictitious economic subject, the narcissism of private interest, and social segregation. Before anyone remarks that we have seen in the communist experiments how the political consequences of inexistence, alienation, and universality look in practice, let us recall that the 20th century communist regimes failed in all three tasks. They have supported their political projects on the triad of history, class consciousness, even if they were not all Lucasian, and the no less intense forms of segregation. The political task of a party that wants to claim the predicate communist remains in insisting at this interplay of the subject's existence and the inexistence of history. Just as for Lacan, the politics of his school was rooted in the existence of the subject of the unconscious and the inexistence of the other. With his critical move, Marx grounded the first theory of the subject that presupposed the total abolition of two central worldview illusions, human essence and social homeostasis, on which the capitalist worldview is grounded. Abstract freedom and abstract equality presuppose an equally abstract human essence, while private property and private interest ground the social consensus, behind which there is nevertheless a fundamental submission of political universalism to the particular interest of capital. The proletariat, the social embodiment of the subject, and class struggle, a concrete manifestation of the inexistence of the other, represent two critical responses to the construction of a worldview and openly sabotage the undisturbed satisfaction of the insatiable capitalist imperative of creation of value. Marx addressed the necessity of displacing the struggle from the, from the interpretation of reality, the infamous conflict of interpretations, to the form of interpretation in his often cited and almost as often misunderstood 11th thesis on Feuerbach. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. The thesis formulates the opposition between interpretation and change, theory and praxis, philosophy and revolutionary politics. Here, worldview Marxism is disqualified from the very outset. It may have brought about a revolutionary change, but it adopted an interpretation of history that pushed it back in the centralized and totalizing framework of a worldview. Even a reactionary thinker like Heidegger understood that Marx's final thesis, in fact, questions the dichotomy between thinking and action and conditions the actual change of the world with a change of the form of interpretation, thereby articulating a demand for a new form of philosophy that would account for the change. Behind the apparent opposition of theory and praxis, the 11th thesis opposes two heterogeneous logical regimes of interpretation. All past philosophies presumably remained within the dis dispositive of worldview interpretations, where the change, the conflictuality of the historic movement is excluded from interpretation, or where history and reality know no contradiction. Looking back at the history of philosophy, one can, of course, immediately object that it would be difficult to find philosophers who were merely occupied with the static interpretation of reality without raising the question of political change. From Plato's ideal state, theorized on the background of the crisis of Greek polis, via Descartes' foundation of philosophy on the changes introduced by scientific modernity, up to Kant, Fichte, and Hegel's enthusiasm for the French Revolution. Philosophers seem to have been more preoccupied with thinking possible changes rather than interpreting the given order and filling the gaps in reality. But, as already stated, the problem of the critical interpretation in Marx concerns first and foremost the closed world of universal commodification, where the commodity form is the ultimate horizon of other forms of thinking, and where the change already is the actual state of things, the permanent revolution mentioned by the Communist Manifesto.
Reality already includes change, but what the critique of interpretation envisages is an articulation of political theory in practice that departs from the formalization of the structural contradictions that determine the functioning of social links, as well as the consequent abolition of the hypo hypothetical other and of the centralized model of subjectivity. The theses target young Hegelians and political economists, and not so much philosophy as a whole. Marx's insistence that a materialist theory of the subject conceives the latter as a consequence of social relations and not on a false hypothesis of an abstract human essence indicates that the displacement of the accent from interpretation to change should also be read, read as a shift in the understanding of change itself in the capitalist scientific universe where reality essentially comes down to permanent change the latter loses its a priori revolutionary character. The structural change that could bring about a new social link, abolish the abstract universality of commodity form, and construct a new figure of political subject presupposes a correct interpretation of the given logic of change, the conditions of the permanent capitalist revolution. Again, the point of departure should be that the other is lacking. Lacan. From this, point, from this point, it is not astonishing that a major portion of philosophy seems to fall into the totalizing regime of interpretation. In his critique of worldviews, Freud outlines their three central functions and, ex and exemplifies them in reference to the conflict between modern science, the motor of revolutionary changes in the register of knowledge, and Christianity. Christianity the most persistent and consistent worldview in history which successfully integrates every change in its form of interpretation. If we are to give an account of the grandiose nature of religion, we must bear in mind what it undertakes to do for human beings. It gives them information about the origin and coming into existence of the universe. It assures them of its protection and of ultimate happiness in the ups and downs of life, and it directs their thoughts and actions by precepts, which it lays down with its whole authority. Thus, it fulfills three functions. With the first of them, it satisfies the human thirst for knowledge. It does the same thing that science attempts to do with its means, and at that point enters into rivalry with it. It is to its second function that it no doubt owes the greatest part of its influence. Science can be no match for it when it soothes the, soothes the fear that men feel of the dangers and vicissitudes of life when it assures them of a happy ending and offers them comfort in unhappiness. In its third function, in which it issues precepts and lays down prohibitions and restrictions, religion is furthest away from science, for science is content to investigate and to establish facts, though it is true that in its application, rules and advice are derived from the conduct of life. The knowledge of a worldview satisfies the desire for knowledge much better than science, with its epistemological revolutions and instabilities. Worldviews, in addition, produce meaning, which satisfies the desire for persistence. And finally, they generate order, which satisfies the desire for security, excluding the change from the realms of reality. A worldview first and foremost produces a reality that appears to function, a reality without lack or negativity. With these three achievements in mind, the contrast between Marx's critique of political economy and worldview Marxism becomes even more striking. Marx precisely does not solve all the problems of human existence based on an underlying hypothesis. On the contrary, he formulates the central problem of modern political thought, commodity form as the ultimate horizon of social relations in capitalism. The ruling ideologies insist that Marxism is a worldview the object of which is not the way things are, the question of being, but the way things should be, the question of change, not the present but the future. However, Marx's critique is neither a worldview nor a utopian theory. It is rather a reclaiming as an object of thinking and as the condition of politics and revolutionary change of an irreducible... of an irreducible... <clears throat> negativity that traverses social and subjective reality, and of which no one can be expected. There is no metaposition that would ground politics on positive knowledge. <laughs>
but there is the subjective position which grounds politics on conflictual truth. The notion of class struggle replaces the old inadequate questions and answers, the social or the economic contract, with a new radicalized problem, rather than being backed by some mythical contract, convention or relation, society rests on, a, on an irreducible struggle and social non-relation. Capitalism exploits this non-relation, but it can do so only under the condition of mystifying the actual source of wealth with a multitude of ideological fictions, fantasies, and fetishizations. In political economy, Marx uncovers the same three tendencies that, according to Freud, support, support the efficiency of religion. These three tendencies come down to the endeavor to ground the market on stable and predictable laws, which turn it into a positive other that will support a fully functioning social relation. The association of economy with religious mechanisms is most evidently formulated in the famous lines of the poverty of philosophy, where Marx describes, where Marx describes the metaphysical theological tendencies of political economy. Economists have a singular me method of procedure. There are only two kinds of institutions for them, artificial and natural. The institutions of feudalism are artificial institutions. Those of the bourgeoisie are natural institutions. In this, they resemble the theologians, who likewise establish two kinds of religion. Every religion which is not theirs is an invention of men, while their own is an emanation from God. When the economists say that present-day relations, the relations of bourgeois production, are natural, they imply that these are the relations in which wealth is created and productive forces developed in conformity with the laws of nature. These relations, therefore, are themselves natural laws independent of the influence of time. They are eternal laws which must always govern society. Thus, there has been history, but there is no longer any. There has been history since there were the institutions of feudalism, and in these institutions of feudalism we find quite different relations of production from those of bourgeois society, which the economists try to pass off as natural and as such eternal. Smith's figure of the invisible hand remains the best expression of this metaphysical aspiration of political economy. In the market, it presupposes a pre-given rational knowledge, which makes the market appear as an autonomous subject. When Marx later describes the relation of political economy to the capitalist abstractions as fetishist, fetishist he implicitly situates this relation not on the level of perversion, but on the level of transference. In order to envisage the persistence of this attitude in political economy, one merely needs to recall the jargon of contemporary advocates of neoliberal reforms. As the crisis persists, we get bombarded with warnings that radical measures are needed in order to send a positive signal to the markets. The function of reforms and of austerity measures is to calm the markets. The formulations are more than mere rhetorical figures. They actually demonstrate the fetishist disavowal that Octave Manoni condensed in the famous phrase, je sais bien, mais quand même. I know very well that the markets are mere constructions and human inventions, but nevertheless, I believe that they are autonomous and capricious. A double mistake is at work here. Yes, the markets are human inventions, but they contain an autonomous dimension which determines social and subjective reality, and this autonomy is not correctly situated. The reason lies in the fact that political economy and its apparent rationality and false scientificity inevitably contains the inversion of the aforementioned fetishization. I know very well that the markets are autonomous and capri capricious, but I nevertheless believe that they are mere constructions and human inventions. In any case, the autonomy of the structural relations that support the functioning of the market is not taken seriously. Political economy in the same move fetishizes economic abstractions as autonomous entities and relativizes the dimension of causality in this autonomy by regressing back to the false sobriety of conventionalism. The fact is that the economic crisis does not undermine the fetishist relation to the market. It does not unveil the inexistence of the market. Other. On the contrary, on the contrary, 
The more the crisis unveils the instability of the markets, the more the market fuck, the more the market receives the surplus of positive existence. What nevertheless becomes observable is that the capitalist market seems to be much closer to the God of the Old Testament than to the benevolent and abstract God of philosophers and political economists. Not the neutral and self-regulating knowledge of the invisible hand, but a desiring God that demands constant sacrifice, not a homeostatic order, but a negativity whose consequences are devastating. In addition, the imposition of economic reforms and austerity measures as inevitable and quasi-metaphysical necessities recalls the privileged appearance of class struggle in the first volume of Capital, where its paradigm is the struggle for the length of the working day. Is today this struggle not indicated in the debates regarding the length, not of the working day, but of the working life? One can repeat Marx here. Capitalists have their own idea of the ultimate limit of the working life. Evidently, a working life cannot be longer than biological life. The ultimate end of the working life is biological death. However, death can be postponed through the improvement of life conditions and medical interventions, biopolitics, and so on. The argumentation for the extension of work periods comes down to the argument that, that the life expectancy in Europe is today longer than it was in the past. The population grows older, and for this reason the neoliberal reforms are said to be inevitable. Every extension of the life of this life, or sorry, every extension of the working life abolishes past achievements of the workers' struggles in a more efficient manner that an extension of the working day ever ever would. Life and work become inseparable. The entire lifespan is transformed into the precarious life in work.